Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. COVID-19 vaccines are available. To find COVID-19 vaccines near you, visit vaccinate.wv.gov. You can also call the West Virginia COVID-19 info line at 1-833-793-0965. Again, that's vaccinate.wv.gov or 1-833-793-0965 to find your COVID-19 vaccine. All right, so we have been talking about pastures and forest lands and woodlands and how they all kind of blend in to your farm operation. Last week, we talked a lot about establishing a new pasture field, but we really didn't get into a lot of the detail on what types of grasses you might be looking for for our area and how to get them established. So we're going to focus more on that today with a little bit of a recap on what we've been talking about in past weeks. Yeah, in fact, what we talked about a lot last week was erosion, making a plan, and just trying to figure out where you're going to have the biggest problems and the best way to get to the place you want. So let's figure out first, what is it that you want to end up with? Do you want a certain type of grass? Do you have a certain market in mind? And this is actually a great opportunity if you think about it. You can actually figure out what kind of market likes what type of grass, and then you can cater to that market if that is your end goal. Find that niche product. That's a good idea. Yeah, and if you have a grass that maybe you don't like, let's say you're doing Kentucky 31 and your cows just aren't getting the gain that they want, and you've heard extension preach and preach about new types of grasses and how it'll increase your gain, it'll keep uh, the weeds out, it'll keep things lush, it'll keep things vegetative. You know, and that's what you want to do, then this is a good opportunity to do that properly, sequentially, and improve things. Not only are you going to expand, you're going to improve. So this is your chance to not only expand what you have, but also even improve it so that you can either hit that market that you want or have better gains on your cattle. And a fat cow is a more profitable cow. Right. Yeah, that's just true. You can't uh, starve a cow into uh, profitability, right? (laughs) (laughs) All right. So we had talked about getting the trees out of the way. And we've talked about what you're going to do with those stumps and those tops. And now we want to talk a little bit more about how you're selecting those forages. So the first thing, of course, hopefully you've already gotten your soil test done. You've already done some weed prevention steps where you're taking care of your stilt grass or your multiflora rows or any of those things that are really hard to get rid of once you're getting your grasses in. Now, stilt grass is really one of the hard ones because it's a grass. And so you can't just apply a broadleaf herbicide and get rid of it because it's still a grass. So if you have questions about specific weed control, then contact your extension office or your conservation district and we'll help you out. But when you're looking at establishing your forage, you want to consider, as always, I am a huge proponent of death to monocultures. If you have a variety of forages in your field, you're going to have healthier animals and you're going to have healthier forage. So you want to think about grasses and legumes and maybe even some of those so-called weeds, which have really high nutrient values. As long as you can teach your cattle to eat them, plantain and um, what are some of the other good pasture weeds. There's, there's a lot of them that actually have a really high nutrient value and you shouldn't think of them as horrible unless they're going to cause a problem to your livestock or your livestock don't know that they're supposed to eat them. Yeah. And honestly, with the whole concept of grazing weeds, it's really going to depend on what kind of operation you have. A lot of times you'll get, especially with some of the brassicas, you'll get that off flavor in the milk and you're going to get less for it. If you have a dairy, 
Oh yeah, dairy forage is a whole new ball game. <laughs> I know, but but it, but it's good to think about. We should probably do a show on dairy forage. I've written articles about this. You know, you look at the field and you think, okay, why is this a problem? And then you come up with a numerical economic value to that problem. How much is it going to take for me to solve this problem? And you're going to put a numerical economic value on that solution. Like if something is not poisonous, it's not taking over pasture field, and it's not going to affect the quality of your of your livestock. And with the right type of management, the cows will even graze it. It might not be worth your while to treat something. Chicory is so strange because it seems like it takes over everything, but it's not poisonous. And the animals will graze it as long as it's not too fibrous, right? So when it bolts up and then you have a lot of those flowering bolts, there can be some quality in the leaves, but with the proper grazing timing, you can actually get some nutrition out of chicory. And there's other weeds too. Obviously, the ones that are poisonous, the ones that are detrimental to a pasture field, that's a whole different discussion. And that one, if you do the numbers, you'll realize that a little higher in the management side will go a long way. Spotted knapweed is what I'm thinking of. You know, that's something that will not only take over pasture, but you can't smother it out because it likes to allelopathically kill whatever's next to it. So you can't smother out spotted knapweed. So that one you have to treat. And I know that was a big sidebar tangent. <laughs> Well, it, it does get us back into the idea that you are going to have to be managing for weeds in some cases. And especially when you're converting a woodland area into a pasture field, you're going to have a lot more weed encroachment than you would think. Because like I said on the last show, there's a lot of seeds in that bed of soil that you're exposing to sunlight that are going to go, yay, let's grow. So you do have to consider what is your economic threshold for treatment, right? And how are you going to manage those weeds up front? And and let's talk about let's talk about timing. You know, that was one of the things that you and I were kind of talking offline a little bit. And you said the nice thing about renovating a wooded area, and that was the first time you've ever said those words. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> is that yeah, I kind of tricked you out of that one. Uh, is that you can kind of pick when you want to do it and what you want right? And I still think it's very important to do some kind of transition cover crop so that you can properly manage the soil, pH levels, nutrient levels to get what you want when you want it, right? Now, you do have some options with enough future planning in mind. You can figure out what kind of cover crop you want and when you can do it. So you can figure out, okay, um, I do like winter rye, and the best way to establish winter rye is at this point, and it's going to give me this benefit. Or maybe you're like, you know, I have seen pearl millet do really well in a right away reseeding in the middle of the summer, and you know, I think I could work with pearl millet and then get a nice cover in the summertime. So. You can actually figure out what you want and when you want it. So when we're talking about cool season annual grains, winter rye is a very reliable cool season cover crop that keeps it covered in the wintertime. It's also going to give you a lot of biomass. Yeah, and you also want to think about how are you going to readdress this cover crop come springtime? Because rye can sometimes become a bit of a weed problem. And maybe you want to go with a winter wheat instead of a winter rye. But you have to think about how are you going to be harvesting? Are you harvesting the cover crop? Are you going to kill it where it stands? Are you going to graze it? What are you going to do with this cover crop? What time of year is it that you're trying to get it down? You know, we get into these later fall, winter months, and I can guarantee you I'll get at least three calls this winter in November through February from oil companies going, what can we plant right now that will grow? <laughs> it's like, dudes, it's winter time. <laughs> Stuff doesn't grow. You can't expect a plant to grow and thrive in the winter time if that's when you're planting it. So when you're making that plan for that field renovation or getting a new 
cover crop out there, winter really isn't the ideal time to be planting that. No, no, no. I wasn't talking about winter. I was talking about winter rye as the species. Well, I know. But here's something you brought up, right? You're going to have to handle this cover crop next year. Cover crops don't necessarily go away on their own when you want them to go away, but they can. And here's the thing. Winter rye will give you growth throughout winter as long as it was established in the fall. When you get those warmer winters, like kind of the tail end, the start versus the end of winter, it'll take off and it'll give you cover. Winter rye doesn't winter kill. So do you want to spray it? Do you want to harvest it? Then maybe drill some seeds in the stubble. If you don't want to kill it for whatever reason, maybe it's a logistical problem with machinery, time, labor, whatever. Oats. Oats would be something you can establish. August, September. And those will grow, give you some cover. Oats, however, will die in the winter. So the oats are going to kill themselves off, and then you're going to have a mulch. That mulch then will give you a bed to directly drill seeds into come spring. So you're not going to get the biomass that you would with winter rye, but you're also not going to have to go in there as an extra step to kill off the cover crop before you put in the other thing. Right. So oats versus winter rye, two management styles and two ways to handle a bare soil problem in the fall. Right. And winter wheat is the same kind of thing. Winter wheat's going to be a little bit slower to sprout up in the spring. You don't have to get out there as early as you would with winter rye. So depending on what your slope is, what direction you're facing and how quickly you want to get out there to manage this cover crop. Think about that as far as your plan as well. Winter wheat is a great forage that you can use, but you do need to pay attention to how you're going to treat it later, just like you would your winter rye or your oats. All right, so let's move on to the actual pasture grasses. We had a conversation before we started recording about cool season grasses and warm season grasses. And basically you're looking at trying to get yourself situated so that you can continue grazing even during those summer slumps. And so warm season grasses have a very short grazing season, but they do definitely come in handy in July and August. Uh, Hold on. Let's specify here because we were talking about annuals. Now we're transitioning to perennials, correct? Correct. Yes. Your, Your big blue stem, your sorghum sudan, and your switchgrass. Those are all summer perennial Well, you graze them in the summertime because that's when they have the most production. But those perennials need to let them get taller than you would your your cool season grasses, and you're not going to be able to graze them as long. But they can save you in that summertime. But the thing I wanted to bring up was what we talked about offline earlier, and that was if you are making a transition from a wooded area into a pasture field, warm season grasses take a lot longer to get established initially. And you're going to have a lot more effort to get them established in a potentially heavy weed encroachment area. Yeah. So your warm season pasture may not be the one you want to put into your freshly transitioned woodland area. Yeah. Again, you have to be able to manage what you have, right? So warm season grasses are difficult. You're going to require more than a year possibly two years to get a warm season established in a certain area. If you have all kinds of things that you're dealing with already, such as all those weeds, erosion, poor nutrients, trying to get those warm seasons established are going to be next to impossible. And, and, And it's just, you don't want to tackle two major hurdles at the same time. That's the best way I can describe it. There are different ways to establish warm season grasses. I've seen some of the the more simple ways to do it. You can spray down an area with glyphosate, kill whatever's there, whether it's a mixture of weeds and cool season grasses. Chances are it's a bunch of fescue and directly drill in a seeding 
early in the spring. What's going to happen, though, is because warm season perennial grasses take so long to establish, you are going to be fighting weeds, all those summer annual weeds, the winter annual weeds. Heck, the, the perennial weeds that didn't germinate when you sprayed or the ones that are encroaching from the bordering pasture. That's one way to do it. You can spray and plant directly those uh, warm season grasses. But then it is a very vicious battle against the weeds and the desired plants. Another way to do it is to utilize those cover crops. Maybe put some oats in, so spray or till oats. The oats will grow up, smother out those weeds. It'll die off so that the following spring, you can drill in those warm season perennial grasses, keep the weeds down, and then see how they do. That's another way to do it. Another option would be two rounds of smothering where you go oats early on, like in the spring, kill. Then you go with winter rye, kill, and then you come back again, finally planting the perennial warm season grass. Sometimes you might want to spray to kill everything that's there, plant a cover crop, spray again following a harvest of that cover crop so that you're getting a double dose of weed kill because establishing those warm season perennials is a major battle against weeds. And the weeds will easily outcompete the warm season perennial grasses. At first. Right, right. During establishment. They don't have that vigor. Yeah. Once established, however, those warm season grasses have really deep roots. They're very drought resistant. And it's almost like managing a warm season annual. Typically, you're going to get taller grasses. They're going to have a higher growing point. They're going to have deeper roots. And you're going to treat them that way. But as Karen said, it is a great way to have a very nice commodity like as far as the luxury forage in your pasture fields. But again, if I just want to expand my pasture with warm season perennials, if you're cutting down trees and you're dealing with fertility problems, extra weed problems, and erosion issues, that's not the time to start dealing with a warm season perennial. Yeah, and if you have questions on establishing warm season grasses to get yourself through that summer slump, so that you don't overgraze your cool season grasses during that time period, contact your local extension office and we'll get you some information on how to get those warm season grasses established. So we're moving on to cool season grasses and which ones might be better for your operation. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about different uh, establishment techniques, how you're getting the seed out there. And that's really going to be dependent on what your area or what your um, terrain looks like. If you have a steeper slope or if you have weird bumps in the ground because, you know, <laughs> you're here. <laughs> but if you don't have a nice, flat, smooth pasture that you're developing, you know, there may be some tricky aspects to getting the seed out there. You can't just go out there with a, a no-till drill and, and spread everything out nice and evenly. I mean, no-till drills are great because they reduce the loss of soil and reduce erosion because they don't really disturb the soil. You just go out and you put the seed right into the sod that's already there. For a transition from woodland, you don't really have any sod to plant into. But if you do have sod, you want to make sure it's very short. You want to graze it down to about two inches before you go put your no-till drill seeding out there so that the new seeds have enough sunlight to get them up and filling in those bare spots. But there's also frost seeding. You know, If you want to throw some seed out there in the wintertime, you want to look at February, March to get the seed out there and then let the cattle or other livestock go through and trample it in. Uh, you don't necessarily want to feed it. I know that there is a technique out there where you put the seed in with the hay that you're feeding the animals and then take them to the field where you want them to seed. 
but that's not a really good technique because A, they're going to eat the seeds and digest part of them. So you're going to lose seed. And then they're not going to be even unless you're doing mob grazing to get the manure spread evenly. It's not really a reliable method. Now that is that is a technique with some variability right there. Right, yeah. <laughs> Honestly though, the key thing that you have to remember in any seeding, any method is seed to soil contact. That's right. Yeah, seed to soil contact. You know, another great way to do it is to get a really short graze or even to till, but you need to have a nice firm bed. So whether that's compacting, running a uh, cultipacker, you can actually seed and then run a cultipacker over the seeding to get better seed to soil contact. You know, and that's uh, the idea when you frost seed and then you put the animals there, they'll stomp it in, you'll get the freeze thaw cycles to kind of open up the ground, but you need to get that soil and the seed Good contact. Seed to soil contact and timing, that's a secret. You know, however you do it, seed to soil contact and timing of when you've seeded is the recipe for success. Yes. So let's talk about selection then. What grasses do you want to put out there? Think about what do you want to have the grass for? What is your soil type? Do you have a lot of drought where you are? You might want to lean away from Timothy because it doesn't have good drought tolerance. Or if you have flooding, if you're in a lower bottom and you have flooding that occurs, so you, again, want to avoid Timothy. But maybe you want to do some reed canary grass because it has excellent flooding tolerance. Yep. And so think about that. Another cool season grass that does really well in areas of high moisture prone to flooding is Kentucky bluegrass. And that's another option if you like it. I honestly find that the novel, like Kentucky 31 is a, um, is a fescue, like tall fescue, right? Tall fescue gets a bad rap because of the end of fight that prevents the weight gains in the animal. But with these new variety of seeds, you can actually get what's called a friendly end of fight where you have the environmental resistance to droughts and to heat and to cold as well as the ability of that plant to gain nutrients by a symbiotic relationship with the endophyte underneath the ground and not produce the alkaloid toxin that causes blood vessel constriction, which can be linked to certain cattle abortions as well as reduced weight gains. Yeah, and horses are also very susceptible to that endophyte. But the thing about the fescue, even with the novel endophyte or the friendly endophyte in it, is that it is kind of a waxy leaf, typically. And if you do have horses, the horses aren't going to like that real waxy, high-fiber leaf. And cattle, they can manage it better than a horse where you want something softer. So figure out what you want to use it for and what conditions do you have. Yeah, and if you're looking at tall fescue and you have a highly erodible area, you want a plant like that that's going to be easy to establish. So your tall fescue, your perennial ryegrass, or your, maybe even your Italian ryegrass, those are all excellent plants to get established fairly easily. And so think about the erodibility too and how you're going to work with that. But also your winter hardiness. If you have really cold winters, if you're up on the top of the hill and you get a lot of wind and a lot of ice, you want to get a grass that's got higher winter hardiness. So there, your perennial ryegrass is not going to be happy. And your tall fescue is only going to do okay. You want to look more towards your Kentucky bluegrass, your quack grass, your reed canary grass, your smooth brown grass. And even your Timothy will actually do better for, for those really cold areas as long as it's not going to be droughty up there. And do you want a companion legume? Yes, that's key too. Yeah. So are you going to be looking for more of a sod forming grass? Or you're looking for more of a bunch type grass. If you want a companion legume, chances are you're going to do better if you have a bunch type grass where it can kind of give space for the legume and the grass to grow side by side, similar areas, same pasture field. Yeah, I mean, you look at uh, orchard grass, which is one of the most common, excuse me, pasture grasses that we have in this area. It's very commonly planted. It has excellent regrowth potential but its legume compatibility is fairly poor. So 
it's going to be constantly fighting you against those legumes because the legumes are going to be lower growing and it doesn't really allow for good space for them to produce. And your fescues are going to be on the other end. They're going to grow in more clumps. So that allows for space to grow next to a legume. Then you'll have the endophyte and the legume nitrogen. You're going to have all kinds of good stuff all together, as long as you have the friendly endophyte, right? Because we don't want our cattle to be exposed to too much of that alkaloid because the biggest waste of money or the biggest loss of money, I should say, is when a cow aborts a calf. Oh, yeah. It's a bad day. And if that's an issue where you are, then maybe renovation is the best way to do it. So you can put some either friendly into fight grasses or just get rid of fescue altogether and put some grasses in there that don't have the end of fight so that you have reduced that potential problem. Right. And that just brings us all the way back to paying attention to what's going on on your farm, keeping good records, saying, okay, well, I've had cattle abort calves for the past five years. I don't know what's going on. I've given them right minerals and everything else. But you happen to notice that it's always when they've grazed a certain pasture field. Well, maybe that pasture field has those toxic endophytes and that is what's leading to it. So keeping good records allows you to identify patterns that can help you make good management decisions. And maybe it would be worth your time and money to completely renovate that particular pasture field where you've been losing calves. Yeah. And also keep track of when you are putting certain animals in certain pasture, because there are certain times where the plant's a little bit hotter than others. Yep. Yep. Before we leave you today, if you have questions, please reach out and ask them because there's no point in you having to try to do this on your own. We are here to serve you and to assist you. So please reach out to your local extension service. And if you would please also reach out to us and let us know what you think about the show. We really love your feedback. You can rank us on your podcast app if you're listening to it on a podcast, or you can just give us a call or send us an email if you are listening on the radio. You can find Dan Lima at OSU at Belmont County Extension or me at WVU Ohio County Extension, Karen Cox. And we look forward to hearing from you. A team of our colleagues from WVU are working to improve health in West Virginia. One in 14 West Virginians will be selected to participate in the Mountain State Assessment of Trends in Community Health Survey, or MATCH Survey, to gather important health information specific to West Virginians. Why is this important? Your feedback will help the state and local communities better address your health needs, increase access to health resources, and better understand the reality of health in your community. If you or someone you know happen to be selected to participate in the MATCH Survey, take the time to share your health experiences. You can learn more by visiting wvmatchsurvey.org. Thanks for listening to Extension Calling. This show is a collaboration between OSU Belmont County Extension Educator Dan Lima and WVU Ohio County Extension Agent Karen Cox. If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.